we aren't going to be clicking a lot of links in this presentation, but uh, it is important that you know that a lot of our services and resources are things that you'll find through our library website, which is library.missouri.edu. So anytime you need to get started, that's the place online where you can go to start your search for materials, to initiate contact with us, and so on. So if you don't have that bookmarked already, please go ahead and, and bookmark that at some point because you will want to get back to that site quickly and easily. Uh, a little bit about our libraries. So we use that plural because there are a variety of libraries spread out across the MU campus. Ellis Library is the big library here in the heart of campus. Uh, Ellis Library is home to a lot of our subject librarians as well as departments such as our special collections, um, our government information, and very recently our archives. So a lot of those um, specialized services you'll be able to find in Ellis. But along with Ellis, we also have a health sciences library, uh, an engineering library, geology, journalism, math, and vet med. And in, in addition to that, we also house a lot of materials offsite in a depository here in Columbia. So we have lots of facilities spread out all around the MU campus and the Columbia area. So as I said, we have several presenters today. So our first section of this presentation is going to be uh, Gwen Gray and Kimberly Muller, both research and instructional services librarians. They're going to be discussing research support. After that, Cindy Kotner, who's our head of access services, will discuss, will discuss discovery and access. And then I will uh, 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 be presenting about our teaching support. So with that in mind, Gwen and Kimberly, take it away and just tell me when you need me to, to advance slides. So thanks for joining us today. I'm Kimberly, and this is my colleague Gwen, and we're excited to kind of talk about how we can support your research. So if you'll go ahead to the next slide, Joe. We're going to jump in with a great graphic that I really like from our health sciences librarians. They put this together, and it's a little overwhelming. There's a lot of text on this slide, so we're going to break it down as we go, but it really just will dig into some of the different ways that the libraries can be involved in all steps of the research cycle from the concept of what you might want to be researching all the way through the publication and determining like what impact that publication has had. So if you'll go ahead Joe to the next one. We know that you're experts in your subject area, you're experts in research, so we're here to partner with you on that research and just make it as efficient and effective as possible um, so that it's not bogging down the time that you're spending in the library side of things. So I put database searching and subject specific searching because there are hundreds and hundreds of different places that you might start looking for research. And we can partner with you in figuring out maybe the three or the five locations that would be the most effective to dig into and then create search strings that will again be the most effective to find the results that you're looking for. For the literature reviews and systematic reviews, I did wanna highlight this because we also partner with publishing and writing these types of publications. So this can look like creating a search string with you and just partnering and making that recreatable um, piece so that when you're writing your methodology, it's something that another researcher could duplicate and could recreate. But this also can look like pulling the search results, exporting them, going through them with you, writing the literature review in the background section of an article, writing the methodology section. So those are all pieces that I've helped contribute as a co-author with um, when looking at literature. So again, we can partner in lots of different areas in this just to make your job and your publications easier. One of the other things that we can do in this preparation for doing research is assist with data management plans. And I wanted to highlight this because a number of grants now actually require that you have a data management plan, things like NSF and NIH grants. This is now something that you have to have and the libraries are the place where you can go and do that. Our institutional repository, which Gwen's gonna talk a little bit about in a second, actually does have a place to store data so that you know it's going to be accessible to yourself later, but also to other researchers that might want to double check and dig into the data that you collect as well. And as part of that, we also teach workshops on software that helps analyze data, things like carpentry, and can help with things like text mining and data mining for those projects. So you'll go ahead. Yeah, and just to pick up on a little bit on the data mining, text mining, we especially want to talk to you before you start any project like that, because we usually do have to get clearance from our database providers that you can indeed do that. And sometimes 
I've helped faculty who have set up alternative, like their own accounts to get to the data. So let us know if you need to do something like that. It really saves us, it saves you time and it saves us a lot of headaches too. Um, for publication, we if you have an article or some research you want to publish, you're not sure where to go, where you know it might best fit, we can help you identify journals that are out there um, where you might want to publish your research. We can also encourage you and talk to you about open access. So making your data, your research available to others. A lot of even the more I'm going to put a quotation marks, reputable journals nowadays have OA sides, open access sides. So we are very familiar with that, that side of publishing. As Kimberly mentioned, we have a repository where your data and even your articles, if you did a dissertation here, could go. And that's called MoSpace. It is maintained by the libraries, and it will be a place where in per perpetuity, your information will be accessible. So it kind of feeds into that open access idea too. Um, we can help you with copyright. We have a librarian who's pretty well versed in copyright issues and we all get a fair number of questions about, I wanna put, let's say Harvard Business Review articles on reserve. What do I do? Or I wanna reuse this. And we can help you navigate the copyright landscape. The other thing we can do is help you with your citations. If you're trying to figure out a style, what to use. I had a, a distance student the other day who was trying to cite a statute for the state of Georgia and was having a heck of a time finding it in APA. And by golly, we found something that showed her exactly how to do it. And if you have any questions about that, we're happy to work with you on that. And just to tie in before we move to the next slide, one of the big things about copyright in most space that I want to highlight, and I think is sometimes not well known, is that we can work with you on maintaining copyright for your publications. So if you put an article in a journal, yes, the journal often holds that copyright and they hold the rights to the publication, but usually what they hold is the rights to the PDF, the fancy version, and you might still hold rights to the original manuscript, the Word document, and we can add that to most space. And we do have a librarian, Stephen Pryor, who can work with you on navigating those copyright things before you sign away your rights so that we have that option. And the reason it's beneficial for you to do this is not only does it make your work accessible, it means people on Google Scholar, when they come across it from other countries or from universities that don't have access to every journal and every database, won't hit a paywall when they try to access your research. So your research can be used much more broadly, but it also means your citation counts mm -hmm. will go up. So if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about why that's important. We don't love playing the citation game, but metrics are a big part of promotion and tenure. Being able to say like, my research is important and I can prove it's important because I can prove that this many people have read it and you know X number of people have cited it and used it in their research. So I'm contributing to that scholarship conversation. And so part of that is what you would put together when you're going up for promotion or tenure. And part of that is what we'll pull together to help you in that process. We want you to be successful in going up for PNT. And so we're partnering with you in ways to make your contributions to academia, academia um, the most successful and the most visible that they can be. And there are really wide variety of where these metrics can be pulled from. So I'll meet with every single one of the faculty in the departments I work with when they go up for PNT. We'll pull together a metrics packet. And this includes things like personal author profiles. So we'll have, talk to you about the different profiles that are out there, how you create them, why you would want them in the first place. Um, so there's author's metrics. There are journal metrics, things like impact factor, pretty well known, but there are a lot of other metrics that are available beyond just impact factors. So we look at comparing statistics and comparing metrics across the board. So even if impact factor doesn't exist for a journal, we still have metrics to provide that can show the credibility and show the widespread use of your work. Um, and then also article level metrics as well. So all of these things play a role when you're putting together promotion and tenure and the libraries are your partner in doing that. So if you'll go to the next slide, I have an example of what one of these packets might look like. This is a John Smith, these, these are not real. Um, this is an example that I show faculty when they're starting to go up the first time. And as you can see, there's a lot of different metrics that we can pull. Um, you don't always need to have all of them, but there's a wide variety that we can look at and see what best fits your application for promotion and tenure. And I do provide a letter as well to the PNT committees so that 
it describes what these different metrics are, where they're coming from, what they mean. So it's not just like, here's a chart with a bunch of numbers that don't make sense. Um, you get the numbers, but you also get the explanation where they're pulled from, what they mean, why they matter. Um, and all of that comes together through your partners at the libraries. And just to jump in, we do need about eight weeks notice. Oh, I, I usually, it depends on the time of year you're going up. If it's the time everyone's going up, more time is always better. If you are on it in advance, I'd say two weeks, because it does take time to go through, you know, all the publications that you put together. Okay. And lastly, we just want to talk on collections. If you have a book you desperately need, um, you want to know if the libraries can subscribe to a journal or get a particular database, please contact your librarian. And if you don't know who to talk to, there's a little Ask Us button on our homepage that slides out from the right. You can always just click that and whoever's manning our uh, chat service can tell you who to talk to. Um, we also can talk to you about our budget, which is not the prettiest thing to talk about, <laughs> but that's, it is important and it's something that your librarian, because all of us work with particular departments, can talk to you about and answer any questions you might have. Basically, as it says on the bottom, just ask. Yes. We're happy to, to, to uh, handle whatever question you throw at us. And we talked a lot about publications and about material for research, but we're also always available for consultations one-on-one -on -one if you just want to yes. go over a project that you're working on and get a fresh pair of eyes on it. Yep. Okay. I think that's it. Yep, that's it for us. All right. So before we move on to Cindy's section, I wanted to stop and see if there was anybody uh, either in the chat or who wanted to jump on mic, anybody from the audience who had any questions for uh, Gwen or Kimberly about the research support. All right. So if you think of anything, uh, feel free to, to ask after the next sec uh, section or near the end. Uh, I will go ahead and move on uh, to Cindy Kotner. Okay, let me unmute myself. <laughs> Welcome everyone, it's so nice to see you. Um, we're excited about a new academic year. So Kimberly and Gwen have talked about some of our collections and I'm going to talk to you about how to discover what we have and then how to access them. So next slide, please. So um, I always tell students when I'm teaching a class, you see this gray box here. We give a lot of real estate on our gateway page to this box. That's because this is the front door to finding resources. There are many doors to finding our resources, but this is the main one. It's very broad. Um, and this is right on our gateway page, right smack dab in the middle. And you'll notice there are two tabs at the top. I'm gonna to talk about each one of those tabs, but the first one is discover at MU tab, and that's the default search. So Joe, if you would move to the next slide. So this tab will search, uh, as, as the slide says, this will search our collections, the, the, the uh, university library collections. It does print, it does electronic, it is very broad. So this is the front door. It's full, it's, it's wide, it's, it's very encompassing. Um, all disciplines are included, but there are ways that you can narrow your search with, we call it faceted searching. We can show you how to do that. We show students how to do that. So this is a great starting point for any research. Um, next slide. <laughs> but beyond the default, which is our collections, you can search MU and beyond right with that little click right, that little link right there. Right before this session, I did a search and I put in COVID-19 Missouri. The default, which is just our collection, I got about 6,000 hits. When I clicked on this link, I got about 68,000 hits. So you can see it's much broader. Now you say, well, why would I want to search that if, I, if it's not at Mizzou? I'm, I'm going to tell you how you can access items that are not in our collection. And that's one of the main, uh, interlibrary loan, that's one of my main departments. Um, but sometimes students, especially undergraduates, just want to find something in our library. So you can do either with, with, uh, with this Discover at MU tool. Okay. So the second tab is books and media. If you don't want articles or anything that's not non-book, you can get, you can click on only the books and media tab. Um, I put in the term Oklahoma right here. And I got obviously books with the Oklahoma as a title, but I got a DVD for the, for the musical. I got scores 
for if you want a music score. I also got a map on the state of Oklahoma. <laughs> so um, this, this tab, the books and media tab is non-article material. So, um, okay, move on. And a fun fact, if you want to search only eBooks, you can do that. You can eliminate everything, print books, everything, and just click on the search ebook. This might be especially useful if you are teaching a distant class. So students who cannot come into the, who cannot physically come into campus for the libraries, they can search only what do we have in ebooks and maybe uh, limit their search to that. So it's very useful for distant students. So this is a uh, a relatively new feature we added to this uh, Discover at MU uh, in the last couple of years. Okay. And other doors, I told you this was the front door, the main door, but there are other ways of getting into our resources. And as instructors uh, and graduate students, you might be more interested in specific uh, databases by subject. So we'll notice that you can, if you know a specific database title, you can click on the database link there or if you have a particular subject area, you can see what resources are available in that subject area. Um, uh, I'm gonna move to the next slide. <laughs> so some of the subject areas listed here, um, they are more sophisticated than the broad. You can be, they're more focused. They're not as comprehensive, so you won't get near as many um, hits, but they will be more focused. And some of the subject databases, you can be very specific in how you search. For example, in the psychology database, you can actually limit your search by age of the, the, the participant, the researcher. So if you wanna do children, if you wanna do the aged, if you wanna do teenagers, it has an option to limit your research by those subject areas. History database has options to limit by specific years. So if you're looking in the Byzantine or <laughs> World War I era, you can limit in a history database, you can limit by that business. You can search by some of the business codes like NAICS codes or whatever. So these databases by subject have much more sophisticated searching tools and we, will, we, we can teach you how to use those. Okay, move on. Um, I always tell students this little find it at MU link. This button is one of the most important buttons, in my opinion, on the database, <laughs> on our web pages, because this will tell you, you can click on that link and it will try to find the full text article for you. So if you're not sure if we have access to it or not, clicking on this link will, will try to pull up the full text in all of our mini databases. So um, it, it's, it is extremely useful. And we have a fun fact, if you'd go to the next screen. So fun fact, you can, uh, you can uh, make your Google Scholar search. You can include this Find It at MU link uh, in Google Scholar. And we have instructions on how to do that. So if you like to search in Google Scholar, you can add the Find It at MU link to it. Uh, it may look a little different. Uh, it may not be actually a button, but it will say find it at MU on it. So yeah, there it is. The, the blue arrow points to it. it. It does have that. So so a nice feature there. If you like searching Google Scholar, you can add this feature and, and then click right to the full text. So, okay. So another fun fact is we have virtual librarians on duty almost 27. I think there's 14 hours on the weekend where this service is unavailable. So if you are, if you are a three o'clock in the morning researcher and you are stuck and you need assistance, you can use our chat. This is actually what Gwen was referring to earlier, I believe. This little button pops out and you can chat with a librarian just about almost 24 seven. So a nice service there. So, okay, and so I, now I wanna talk about more my area, which is access services. So there are many ways you can access these services. You can do the old fashioned way and actually come into the library and visit our, our building, our, our, our libraries. Um, we have beautiful spaces. Um, and this is one of my favorite pictures as I love these windows that are in some of the, in some of the uh, rooms of the library. Our, most of all, our, <clears throat> for most of the libraries, our stacks are open. We do have some restrictions after COVID. Some of the specialized libraries have 
closed stacks or only for faculty in that building. But for the most part, our stacks are open so you can come into the building. We also have a service called proxy service, which means if you have a, um, a student worker or you have an office support staff person uh, that you want to ask them to check out materials in your name, we can set up a proxy card for them. And that's a service that we have established. And if you don't want to physically come, you can have someone else check out those materials for you. Okay. Um, so um, we can actually, or if you don't want to come to the library at all, we can get the materials for you. So you can put a hold or a request on materials in, the, in our catalog, which is called Merlin. And we can, we can pull it, we can go to the stacks and pull it for you and put it then on hold at the, at the, at the checkout desk. So there are multiple ways of doing that. I'm not gonna go into details, but there's a couple of different request buttons in the catalog. If you only want a chapter or two, we can, in, instead of the full book, we can scan in a couple of chapters and send it to you electronically. So uh, we call that our scan and deliver service. So um, that is something that you can do if you don't want an entire book. And in fact, just this morning, we, we scanned two chapters and sent it to a student who lives in the, the country of Colombia. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. So um, yeah, so we can do that for you as well. So, okay. And beyond our own libraries, we have, we have partners. So there's, we, have a, we belong to library consortiums called Mobius. And that is mostly Missouri academic libraries. There are some public libraries and there's some libraries outside of Missouri, but for the most part, like St. Louis University, Washington University, some of the other large libraries in the state, we have agreements with them. We ship books back and forth constantly to those libraries. And we have actually a courier who drop, we don't even send them through the mail or UPS. We have a driver who drives back and forth. And every morning we get tubs full of books <laughs> and we ship tubs full of books. So, um, so with, with Mobius, with one click uh, in the catalog, you can go from searching our catalog into the larger Mobius catalog. And then beyond Mobius, even larger is a, another consortium called Prospector, which as you can figure out would be Western uh, libraries like Colorado and Wyoming. And that is a yet another uh, group of libraries that we have uh, agreements with that we send books back and forth all the time. So we enlarge our pool of books uh, for no charge. There's no, there's no charge to the service. Uh, by just one click in the catalog. You can see what they have and request that it's, and you can do all of this yourself. You do not need a library. You do not need staff to help you. You can click on the, the buttons in the catalog. And usually we say it takes um, two to four working days for a book to arrive. Depends, you know, on a number of factors, but uh, it's not too, it's it's fairly quick and, and fairly reliable. So, okay. Um, Go next, yeah, interlibrary, so interlibrary loan. If there is not a book available in, in the Mobius or, or Prospector Consortium, then we do our traditional interlibrary loan. And this is what I was referring to earlier. If you see an article or a book that we do not have access to in any of our uh, partner libraries, <clears throat> our staff will then go online and figure out which library in the world has the material that you want and we will request it for you. And we literally do go all over the world. Obviously we, we try to go local first and, and, and try to um, not go to, 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 to the UK if we can find it in St. Louis, but um, we, we, we do go over, you know, we do ask libraries in other countries frequently. So um, if there is an item that you want that we do not have avail the access to, we can, we can try to get it for you. And, and it, that's called our interlibrary loan service. And here are, here's some information about that. So, okay. And, um, oh yeah, course reserves. Okay, so another service that we have is we can, so an accessible um, service for your students. If you have a book or materials that is going to be used heavily by students in your course, um, you can put those items on reserve. Uh, you can put print reserve, which means they would have to come into the building, either our library or if you're uh, in the journalism or health sciences library, either one, any of those libraries. Um, 
we would put that materials on reserve for your students. It might check out for two hours or overnight. So it's something that's heavily used that we want to make readily available to students in your class. Or there is the e-reserve component, which means that uh, we can provide special links to articles or eBooks uh, or streaming videos. And um, for the videos, th these, uh, these materials are password protected by a course, but either, either it appears in your Canvas course or we have a special uh, central page in, um, in the library web pages for your, your course that would be password protected and your students could access that, those materials. So these are this is another way your students can access. And we also include uh, for personal books, if you, we don't buy textbooks normally in the library, we, but, but if you have a personal copy of the textbook in your class, you could put that personal copy on reserve um, and your students can access it for two hours at a time or whatever. So that's, that's a thought if, if the bookstore runs out of, of textbooks or whatever, that is something that you might, you might consider. So, okay. <laughs> and fun fact, <clears throat> all of, um, all, all users of the library, when they, for the most part, normal books, they check out for four months. However, graduate students, can then renew a book up to five times. So that would be a total of six, six, uh, four months, be a total of two years. So you check it out one time and then you can renew it five more times. So you graduate students could have books up to two years. And faculty, we have recently just changed that to have unlimited renewal. So faculty could have a book for a long time. <laughs> Now, now, I will have the caveat, if someone puts a request on the book and you've had it for, um, for a certain amount of time, we will ask you to return it. So this is assuming that no one else is putting a hold or a request on that book. But barring that, and it's a normal, it's a regular book, you can, you can renew it a number of times. So it's a, kind of a fun fact. Okay. And the last thing, this is brand new. In fact, it's not operational yet, but I think we are getting very close, is <clears throat> we have contactless lockers. And um, there's, a, there's one here in Ellis Library and there's one at the, in the med school for, for um, people using the health sciences library or the med school. So um, when these become operational, which I hope will be in the next couple of weeks, um, you will get, you can put a, a request on an item. We will go down and put them in a locker. You can see there are different size lockers and um, you will be sent an email with a code. You can then come in and get, uh, t type in your code. That middle green thing that you see in the middle is actually a, an iPad <laughs> and you can type in your code and the door will pop open. You can pick up your things and go. They'll already be checked out. So you do not need to come to the circulation de desk. And um, this, in, in our building and in the med school, these lockers are available 24 seven because we have these located in between our, uh, we have two sets of doors and it's right in between the door. So the one set of door is locked, but the first set of doors is not locked. So these lock, lockers are going to be accessible 24 seven. So um, that is something that we're kind of excited about. So, okay, I think that's it. <laughs> All right, uh, so I have the last section here and I did want to wait uh, just a moment to see if anyone had any questions for Cindy about uh, discovering access or any questions you had thought of for Kimberly and Gwen. If so, uh, feel free to ask now or we will do one more, uh, have one more window for questions at the end. All right, so uh, let's, uh, we will have, as I said, one more chance for people to ask questions at the end. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about our instructional services. So um, as you can imagine from hearing everything that Kimberly and Gwen and Cindy have discussed so far, there uh, are a lot of things that we provide and offer uh, here at the libraries and a lot of those things can seem very daunting to students uh, as they begin the process of conducting research 
in, uh, in their classes. And uh, very few students come into college with the knowledge necessary to navigate all of these systems and resources that we make available. And so we do uh, take on some of the responsibility for ensuring that the MU community knows how to use the materials that we make available to them. So why are we involved in teaching? According to MU, graduates of a baccalaureate program should be able to do all variety of things. There is a list of core learning objectives uh, outlined on the provost website. And that's one of the things I believe we link to in that uh, lib guide that I linked to at the very beginning of this presentation then, and that I will link to again at the end. Uh, you can look at all of those. And this is not a comprehensive list of all of those um, uh, learning objectives, but these are four that are listed very early on as the kind of activities that uh, are very closely tied to conducting research in the library or or using uh, discovering and using information that somebody might find kind of what we would think of out in the wild on the open web perhaps so things like finding existing sources of information evaluating that information to determine whether or not it is relevant and credible uh, conducting appropriately appropriately focused library research so not just diving headlong into our collections and just trying to stay afloat and hope that you can find things but actually understanding the resources that we provide and understanding how they work understanding how those search fields work understanding how the facets and limiters within a database work so that somebody can actually go in with a plan and be able to locate the information and the uh, the, the materials in our collection uh, without floundering too much and then organizing that information and uh, and all that data for further analysis so those are all things that uh, any student who completes a four-year program here at MU hopefully will be able to do by the time they graduate and so and so we want to make sure that we can help you as faculty and as grad students who have teaching responsibilities we want to be able to help you uh, teach your students these things so we're also informed a lot by um, a lot of uh, scholarship related to what we call information literacy, which is that the, the concepts and skills that a student uh, will hopefully develop uh, and master as they go through uh, a, a college program. And so uh, I won't go into too much detail about the whole history of discussions of information literacy in the field of libraries and library science, but some of the big ideas that we think of and that we are going, they're going to inform how we craft our instructional services um, are related to a document called the Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education that comes out of the Association of College and Research Libraries, uh, otherwise known as ACRL. And uh, the these six big concepts um, are, are what make up that framework. And they're ideas like authority being constructed and contextual. So understanding what, uh, what makes an authoritative voice or an authoritative figure authority and authority within their particular context their scholarly context uh information creation as a process so understanding that books and uh articles don't just emerge fully formed but that there is a process uh that scholars go through uh from the point of starting their research or even going back to their early education then going through their research process the development of a research process and then all of the writing and editing and review that goes into creation, creating um, monographs, articles, reports, things of that nature. Uh, the idea of information having value. So we want to make sure that we are just talking with students about not only matters of what you would think of as, as value in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property and, uh, and uh, matters related to say like plagiarism but also in this day and age we are having as librarians have to spend a lot of time talking to faculty and students about the actual material costs of maintaining access to all of the information that scholars want to be able to access and want to have available and, and the difficulty of doing that 
and the reasons why those materials are as expensive uh, as, um, as they tend to be. Uh, research is inquiry. So thinking about the research process as the process of asking questions and as a process of really focusing very narrowly on very specific questions, that idea of nibbling around the edges of the discipline, trying to find those gaps in knowledge and asking questions and how one set of questions leads to another set of questions. The idea of scholarship is conversation. And so that ties back into discussing with people uh, that the notion of thinking about like the citation process as signaling to your reader the reading that you're doing the ways in which your research as a scholar or as an author is commenting on or responding to what has come before and getting students to think about uh this sort of scholarly landscape in which you have several researchers maybe all talking about and thinking about the same problems and writing about them, presenting about them, and then responding to or pushing back on certain ideas that are then published. And then searching is strategic exploration. That gets back into that notion of trying to help students not get caught in the trap of just diving headlong into their research without a plan. So being able to think through the plan, think through what it is that they are hoping to find, think through what it is exactly that they need, and then be able to craft search strategies that will help them locate uh, materials either in our collection or that if they're not in our collection, locate those elsewhere. So those are all things that even if we're not sitting down thinking through our developing a lesson plan and trying to check each box on each of these six frames, hopefully somewhere in the back of our mind, maybe even at a subconscious or unconscious level, we as librarians are thinking about these types of ideas, these types of concepts as we're developing our lessons. So our instructional services comprise uh, the work of, a, it includes the work of a lot of different librarians here in the libraries. As you probably gathered from Kimberly and Gwyn's presentation. Uh, we have lots of different librarians who work with different disciplines and programs on campus. Um, so right now we have 21 different people as of this summer uh, who work in our libraries, librarians who work in our libraries who have one or more disciplinary responsibilities. So that uh, those responsibilities in a lot of cases involve um, not just teaching, but also uh, working with the co collection, developing and maintaining a collection uh, of materials for for their discipline or disciplines, and staying in contact with the faculty in those departments uh, to make sure that we have what they need and their students need to be able to successfully com complete research. So 21 people plus the librarians that we have in our special collections department, in our archives, the archivists who work in our archives, the people who work in digital services, our government information librarian, all these different other departments that are not necessarily disciplinary in nature, but those people often, <coughs> excuse me, often take part in, uh, in some of our educational and instructional uh, services and sessions uh, when they can come in and talk about some of the services that they provide. Uh, our instruction can take, uh, for all of you who've been teaching recently know, our instruction can take both a synchronous live form or a recorded or in asynchronous uh, form. And we um, do a lot of both. So we've always done a lot of face-to-face -face teaching in a classroom, but we have a history of being able to record uh, instructional sessions, record lectures, record small tutorials, create guides and other materials that people can watch or use on their own time. And so we are, are happy to do either and whatever makes the most sense for you and your students, we will try to accommodate that. We can do that face to face. So we can bring you and your class into a library classroom or we can go to your classroom or we can do that online like we're doing like right now via zoom and again that really comes down to what your needs are and what your preference is what type of format your class is taking uh this semester or whichever semester in which you're requesting instruction uh, as i said we can do that in the library or in a space of your choosing and we also 
provide instruction for both specific classes. So just for you and your students at your usual meeting time, or we do things like this event right now, which is an open workshop or webinar that's open to a broader audience. This type of event today was open to all MU students and faculty and staff, and a lot of our workshops and webinars uh, likewise are offered to the full MU community, and all people have to do is register and sign up for that. And uh, a lot of these workshops, again, we try to make sure that we, we record and host online so that people who can't make it at the scheduled time can then go back and watch later on. So how do you get started? First off, you need to get to know your subject librarian. If you go into that guide that uh, that I provided you, and again, I can paste that in right now. Uh, if you go there, there will be a link to see the directory of subject librarians. The best thing that you can do is get to know the librarian who works with your discipline and works with your department, because that person is the person that you're going to want to contact for both the services that Kimberly and Gwen were talking about, like assistance with promotion and tenure, assistance with your specific research projects, assistance with uh, obtaining materials that you need for your research, but also that's the person most likely who is going to work with you on instruction. So you can get to know that person. You can have conversations with that person about what your students' needs are and, and start bouncing around ideas for when instruction makes the most sense. Uh, what your what the assignment, how the assignment needs to be designed or your lessons need to be designed to prepare students for an assignment that involves uh, library based research. So uh, some things you can do, you can share your syllabus and assignments with that librarian. It always helps for us to be able to see those things. Uh, schedule inst your instruction sessions well ahead of time. What I mean by that is start the conversation early. It isn't always best to have an instruction session very first thing in a semester. It's probably better to time your instruction sessions for the point of highest impact, which is usually a little bit closer to the time that a student's actually going to start working on the assignment so that they can actually start applying the things that they learn in a class. But that's the sort of conversation that you can have with your subject librarian. Uh, Nav Kanal, who's our e-learning librarian, is not here for this presentation, but I do want to mention some of the things that he and his staff work with and provide. Uh, in Ellis Library, we have what's called a digital media and innovation lab, and this is uh, open to students um, to provide students with a variety of technologies uh, related to uh, digital media that they can use to uh, complete different projects. So as you see here in the, in the uh, photos here, there are, uh, there's green screen technology in there. There is a sound booth and recording equipment. Um, uh, you have the, the Wacom tab with the pen, so a person can draw or write on a, on a tablet and have that uh, saved uh, on a screen so they can do that for writing or for art and so on. He has audio booths with uh, uh, in an audio studio uh, so that students can record interviews, voiceovers, podcasts. Uh, they can record music. Uh, Nob's had people come in with a guitar and, and record a song in the sound booth before. We also have a film studio. So not only using that green screen, uh, but using uh, the camera, the, the video equipment and the cameras that he has available to produce things like video projects. So simple plays, PSAs, students have made documentaries. And then he also has other equipment like uh, 3D scanners. So, uh, so you can actually scan an object into using this 3D scanner and then be able to send that scan back through say a 3D printer, or you can look at it in a, in a program like AutoCAD where you can then go in and play with that design in a 3D environment. He also has animation software and art tablets. So that's what I was discussing on the last uh, page. Uh, Nav also provides support and has been uh, helpfully making sure that the Discover at MU reading list maker is going to work in our new instance of Canvas here on campus. So this allows you to use that Discover at MU tool that uh, Cindy was talking about to actually create a custom reading list from out of materials from our collections. You can create that in Canvas so that students can quickly access, uh, say, articles from our collection within your course environment. We really recommend that people use this and we can provide support on how to how best to use it. Um, sometimes faculty 
who are in a hurry or who already have access to an article might just say download an article and then upload the PDF into Canvas. We really want to encourage faculty to be able to link directly to the to the materials that we have in our collection, link to those materials. Uh, and this is a good way to ensure that that happens. So this uh, this allows you to quickly search for those articles and then through a few quick clicks, you can create your re reading list that students can then use. We also have learning modules. So uh, Nav and his staff take the lead on developing uh, library modules for asynchronous instruction. And so you can incorporate these into your class or you or your students can just go through them on your own time. Uh, we have things like a plagiarism module that introduces students to the concept of plagiarism and how to avoid plagiarism. We also have a scavenger hunt that takes the place of a guided tour. So they can guide students through our physical space in Ellis Library, help them get acclimated with some of our main service points in the library. It also, post COVID especially, integrates a lot more of navigation through our website so that students can kind of learn their way through there. So those are the types of things that we have developed and we can develop for individual classes. So if you would like to have an actual interactive tutorial or a quiz that incorporates say videos that the library has recorded, you can uh, work with us, you can talk with your subject librarian and, uh, and then we can bring Nav into that conversation and his folks to be able to create an instructional element for your class that works for you. Um, also, I am involved and several of our librarians here actually end up uh, getting involved from time to time in these discussions. I, I am uh, one of the people here in the, the library who promotes uh, the use of affordable and open educational resources. So, um, Affordable course materials at MU are things like textbooks and other required materials uh, that that are priced at or below $40. So there has been in recent years a big push to try to uh, see more courses here on campus that use materials that are priced at collectively at no more than $40 per, per course to try to drive down some of those high costs of materials that students often face. One of the ways that you can do that is through the discovery and use of open educational resources, uh, which are textbooks and other materials that have been licensed for free use and free adaptation. So there are textbooks in lots of different disciplines that have been published openly. They are free of charge. You don't have to pay to access them. Students don't have to pay for to access them. And you as an instructor would even be able to go in and tweak and alter and edit certain sections to actually more closely meet your course's needs or to make reference to things that you are discussing in your class. And so I can help you with that. Your subject librarians can get involved in helping you to helping you to integrate course uh, materials from our collection into your course. So if there are again like that reading list maker, if there are articles that you would like to make sure that your students are reading if there are chapters from ebooks and we have a copy of an ebook, we can work with you to make sure that that's properly linked and to make sure that multiple people can access that at the same time. Uh, and and so by doing all of that, hopefully through all that work, we can find ways that you are utilizing our collection and hopefully driving down, pushing down uh, whenever possible the cost of materials for those students. All right, I'm seeing thank yous. So I think uh, we will just uh, call it a day and hopefully we will be seeing you around the libraries and hearing from you uh, as you have research and teaching needs. Thanks. All right, bye everyone.